Less than a kilometer offshore, the Cristobal Colón rests in 20 meters of water. After assembling on the beach opposite the wreck of the Colón, we were ready to move offshore and begin our dive. He wants to tell you something. See. The sharp drop-off from the shore creates a very strong surf. If, it, somebody if someone falls him, down here, whatever he is carrying will be broken. For sure he's broke. Yeah. Yeah. While it looked like a tranquil beach, it was in fact really very tricky. There's a large, slow groundswell that comes in on the beach in that area. And while it looked harmless, it was actually very deceptive. Before long, the team successfully negotiated the surf and managed to get clear to the boat. Even with experience, the two Cuban divers find the conditions challenging. Colón will be the last ship to be investigated, the last of the Spanish fleet to meet her end. She lies silent and shattered in the crystal water, a monument to the violent struggle for empire. Rolling off the back of the dive boat and dropping on down to the wreck of Cologne, you're struck with how big it is on the bottom, particularly as you approach that massive bow with its huge ram in front of it. It dwarfs you, and you really get a sense of this warship. And this ship is a symbol, not just of the battle, but of the naval might of Spain. As we left the massive bow of Cristobal Colón and moved across the bottom, we approached a large hole in the side of the ship. Looking at the side, into what appeared to be a shell handling room for Colón's guns, I could see empty racks where shells had once lined the walls. I could see equipment discarded in the silt. All evidence of the last moments when those shells had been hastily sent up the decks to fire back at the American fleet. Looking up from the hull, you could see the guns lining the side of the vessel. And as we floated past them, you could see that these 57 millimeter guns, Cologne's secondary armament, were among the only weapons that the Spaniards had that day to fire back, because Cologne's main battery had never been installed in the turrets. All a reminder, as we swam along the hull, of why Cervera had written to his superiors on the eve of the fleet's departure for Cuba noting that he and his men sailed off to a sacrifice. These twisted decks and passageways speak as eloquently as any written historical text about the shift in world dominance and the ebb and flow of power and influence in world politics. Those final sounds of round after round smashing in the superstructure on deck, the cries of the wounded and dying, and the splash of survivors as they abandoned the mortally wounded vessels. These were the sounds which marked the end of an empire. Cologne offered the luxury of diving in calm water. Of the three wrecks that we had dove on in Cuba, she was by far the deepest, and as a result, she wasn't plagued by the surge of water as the ebb and flow of the groundswell moved in and out. So much of the structure of the ship survives, allowing us to swim through one deck level after another and get down into what I call the secret world of Cologne.
Surveying the remains of Savannah's fleet continues to be an important activity even in this modern age, long after the battle roar has passed. In examining these shell-ravaged hulls, we learn not only about the individual ships, but the conditions in which the crew struggled, fought, and died at a time when the world was changing dramatically and the balance of power was shifting from the old world to the new. <laughs> 